Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. The high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. <laughs> I, like, I like Paul. <laughs> For you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Paul is undergoing, as we enter into chapter 23, Paul is undergoing incredible persecution and rejection. Paul has been viewed as a traitor. And he is also seen as one who is undermining the religion of Israel. He is especially being rejected and hated because he claims to have been sent by God to the Gentiles. Now, that was his calling. He is what is called the apostle to the Gentiles or the apostle to the Gentile nations. Remember uh, that Jesus had told Ananias when, uh, when uh, Ananias was being told to pray for Paul in Acts 9.15, uh, the Lord had said to him, go, for he, speaking of Paul, is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So he was a man who was called to bear the name of Christ before the Gentile nations from the beginning. Later, when, when Paul would, would be writing letters, he would speak of this calling uh, in letters that he wrote to churches. Romans eleven thirteen, 13, he said, uh, I, for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, he says, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And so he was called to minister specifically to the Gentiles. Now, incidentally, it is always good to have a sense of a calling. You need to know where you're supposed to be if you're going to be used of the Lord. The Lord has a way of leading you to where he would have you. I can still remember this particular fellowship. This church was actually begun in a Bible study in Pomona, transferred into the city of Ontario, and ultimately ended up here. And what you do is you seek the Lord step by step. What do you want us to do and where would you have us to go? And it's a very important thing for us to know where God wants us to be. And Paul knew where God wanted him to be. And so when he, was, when he stated that, that he had been called to minister to Gentiles, the immediate reaction of the Jews who were listening to him was outrage. Remember in chapter 22, I'll show you this if you'd like to turn there for just a moment. In chapter 22 of the book of Acts, remember how uh, in verse uh, 21 through 23, uh, that Paul was speaking, and he says concerning Jesus, he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. So he made that statement, but verse 22, they listened to him until this word. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he's not fit to live. They cried out, tore off their clothes, threw dust into the air. They were excited about that, weren't they? They really were supportive of that. He was called to minister to the Gentiles. So as we've been going through the passages prior to chapter 23, there was a commander who saw what had happened. And when he saw what was happening in all, he, he actually ordered Paul to be tortured in order to be able to gain some insight into why these people were reacting this way. But as a Roman, we saw that Paul could not legally undergo that kind of treatment and was granted the opportunity to defend himself. And so as we enter this chapter, Paul is continuing his defense that he began in chapter 22, verse 30. He is now before the Jewish high court that is called the Sanhedrin. And so he says in verse 1 again, Paul looking earnestly at the council. So this, they're there before him. He's presenting himself to them. And I want you to notice, and it's just a brief note, but 
It says he looked earnestly. Now, the word earnestly could describe his sincerity. It could, it could describe his readiness to speak to them, but it could also mean that he's looking earnestly for someone he might recognize. And we're going to see in just a moment that that takes place. And so as this is taking place and he's looking at them earnestly, he says, verse 1 again, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Now, when he says that, I have lived in good conscience until this day, that could include prior to coming to faith in Christ, that he could live in good conscience even though he was not yet saved. And the reason he would be able to do that is because he had the motivation to please the Lord before he was saved. Even before he was saved, he was pursuing the knowledge of God. He says in Galatians 1.14, I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So he was one who was pressing forward. He was very zealous for the faith that he had received uh, the Jewish faith. And when he was writing in Philippians in chapter 3, verses 4 through 7, he said, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. So he could say, I, I had a clean conscience. I was doing the things that I thought I should do. He believed what he was doing was right. And that means that his conscience could be clean. Before his conversion, he persecuted the church. And he believed that God approved of that. So that shows us something very practically. That shows us that a conscience can be clean, but a person can still be in sin. Just because your conscience doesn't accuse you, and it might even excuse you, it doesn't mean that you're right. He wasn't right in persecuting the church, but he had nothing to say about it. He didn't have any way of accusing himself. Again, that shows that a conscience can be clean. There are people who will, who will argue that their conscience is clean. They'll say, yeah, I stole, but I needed something, right? They'll say, yeah, I was involved in a riot, but we did so for justice sake. Um, yeah, I told a lie, but that was because I was afraid. Somebody might say, yeah, I haven't been faithful to my wife or my husband, but I, I just need love. And the conscience doesn't accuse them at all. They don't have one. It doesn't bother them at all. There are people who have gone out and done horrible things. They've killed kids for a jacket or tennis shoes. And, and um, when the police finally arrive and do arrest them, they're asleep in their bed. They're, they're, there's, they haven't got a worry at all. They're not concerned about what they did. Their conscience doesn't bother them because they've already argued themselves into a clean conscience. A conscience makes judgment based on the highest standards of moral conduct perceived by the individual. But if a person is not biblically informed or rejects what the scriptures say, they can have a clean conscience, but still be in sin because they're rejecting conviction and they live by their own moral code. Again, since his conversion, he had served God with a clean conscience, and now he's able to minister properly in the grace of God. Now, even when your conscience has been cleansed, it's still possible to feel condemned. Perhaps that is something some of us in this room need to know today. Even when your conscience has been cleansed, you can still accuse yourself of things. There's a scripture I want to give you that you might want to mark down, 1 John 3, verse 20. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. He knows all things. Because there are times your heart will condemn you. You may wake up in the morning and remember some sinful thing that you've done in the past, and you forget that you've been washed by the blood of Christ. And your conscience accuses you. There are times that you, you may have been walking with the Lord for a year, two years, three years, or so long, 
But somebody will say, well, you're still the same person you used to be. You haven't changed at all. And you can begin to ask yourself, is that true? And your heart can condemn you. But God is greater than your heart. In Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, Jeremiah writes, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. The heart is deceitful. It's desperately wicked. So in claiming he had been motivated in this way, the court is now being put on the defensive. You see, if he's been led by God to preach Jesus Christ, <laughs> then they're opposing the Lord. So as he says this, again in verse 1, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. The high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. For you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? Well, they struck him, but that was contrary to the Jewish law. That's what Paul's speaking about. Now, the way they're treating him places him in good company because they did the same kind of thing to our Messiah. They did it to Jesus. Remember in John 18, verses 19 through 23, how the high priest asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. And Jesus answered him and said, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Well, why do you ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand saying, do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, if I've spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? So Paul is getting treated similarly to the way the Lord Jesus Christ was treated. So they struck him. That was contrary to the Jewish law. Notice verse 3, his response. God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. The, the term whitewashed wall is another way of referring to him as, them as a hypocrite. Jesus used that term concerning whitewashed tombs. You, you are beautiful on the outside, but inside you are corrupt. And so he's, he's saying, you're just whitewashed, but in reality, you're a hypocrite. Now, why would Paul react in such a way? Because Jewish regulations uh, uh, regulated uh, that kind of action. In, in Deuteronomy 25, the Old Testament, verses 1 and 2, it says, if there's a dispute between men and they come to court, the judges may judge them. And they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, then it shall be, if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, that the judge will cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence, according to his guilt, certain number of blows. He was not guilty. It was a charge, but there was nothing that proved that he was guilty. So what Paul is, is he's angry. Yes, he's righteously indignant at their hypocrisy. Now, when it says, verse 4, do you revile God's high priest? Verse 5, Paul said, I didn't know brethren, that he was a high priest. That's an interesting thing because there really wasn't a high priest at that time any longer on the face of the earth because Jesus Christ is the high priest. You see, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 14, it says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And so there was no longer a legitimate high priest, and thus this man is not a legitimate high priest because Jesus Christ himself is. But they're asking, do you revile him? And he says, I didn't know that. Now, there are other nuances to this. One is, as mentioned, Jesus is the rightful high priest. Ananias is not. Um, some say that Paul was saying, well, how would I know who he was? Because his behavior is deplorable. But then again, the, the office is no longer held by a man, and thus Paul was correct in saying, I didn't know he's the high priest, because indeed he isn't, because Jesus is. Now, as this is taking place, verse 6, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. 
And when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The assembly was divided. For Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, no angel or spirit. The Pharisees confess both. There arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man. If a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And so that's part of that earnestly looking. He actually saw some and perceived that some of them were like he, a Pharisee. And then you had the Sadducees. You see, that was this resurrection, the question of the resurrection, was a dispute that was between two religious parties during the day of Christ. You had several religious parties. When you read the Bible, you'll see them. There are some that are, are well-known and others that are not. The, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees were the major religious parties. You had parties like the Herodians and you had the Zealots and all, but those are minor. What you had are two majors, and the two majors were the, scribe, uh, rather the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, when you look into history, and it, it's kind of muddled in some ways, and it depends on what source you're using to try and determine these things, you'll see that the uh, Sadducees were actually a group of Jews who had been influenced by Greek thinking. And as they had been influenced by the Greek thinking, they began to deny certain things that the Pharisees, who were the separated ones, more conservative, held fast to. And, and some of the things that the, uh, the Sadducees did not believe in was not only the resurrection, but they didn't believe in an angel or spirit either. Now, they would say that we only hold fast to the writings of Moses. And the first five books of the Bible, the writings of Moses, are what we use as authoritative scripture. And they would say that there is no mention of an afterlife found in the writings of Moses. That was the common argument at that time. Now, some of you might remember when we were in Matthew, Matthew 22, there was something that took place when the Sadducees came to argue with Jesus himself about resurrection. And they had given him a story about a woman who had been married to several brothers and in the resurrection, whose wife will she be seeing that she had married all these brothers? You remember that story. And that's where Jesus corrected them in Matthew 22, 31 and 32 concerning the resurrection of the dead. Have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. In other words, when Jesus answered that, he was quoting out of Genesis, and he was saying to them, and he says it in various other places, he was saying to them, um, he didn't say, I was the God, because they're now dead and thus. He said, I am the God of these men, and thus they're still alive. That's the whole point he's making. There is such a thing as the resurrection of the dead, and their problem is, is they're denying that. And yes, you find that in the writings of Moses. We need to remember, and I'll say this briefly, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a cardinal doctrine of Christian truth. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian. It's a cardinal, cardinal doctrine. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he arose again the third day according to the scriptures. And so the resurrection is central to our belief. So he points that out. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not. And perceiving that that was a divided group, he called out the fact that he's a Pharisee and the question related to the resurrection, and the result was a loud cry, verse 9. A loud outcry. The scribes and the Pharisees' party, scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man. Notice, if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now that's an interesting thing that you might not know, you might not notice. Uh, notice how they said it, if a spirit or angel spoke to him. Now that would be a reference to Jesus speaking to him on the road to Damascus. 
they didn't acknowledge that Jesus was speaking, but they said an angel may have spoken to him. Well, that causes a great dissension. Verse 10, there arose a great dissension. The commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. And so once again, he has to be rescued from his own people. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Here's a little tidbit for us if you hear something. I can't imagine what Paul must have been feeling at this time. He got his opportunity to share. He wanted to declare the goodness of the Lord before the Sanhedrin so that these leaders might know that Jesus Christ is alive and that he's been anointed to preach a gospel message that they needed to receive. And then when they got so upset and began to become violent and all, it could be extremely discouraging. And so one of the things that I picked up in this that I want to share for just a moment is this. God graciously comforts his discouraged servants. He has a way of doing that. He comforts us, and that's what he's doing here. Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. I know that you want to go there, and I know that you want to minister there. That will take place. In Psalm 40, verse 1, the psalmist said it like this. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. Um, don't grow discouraged. Don't ever grow discouraged. Don't, don't think that the Lord doesn't hear you when you cry to him. He does. He does. Now, some of you, some of you right now, perhaps you, you, that, that may not minister to you because maybe you're not in a place yet or haven't been in a very severe place yet where you begin to wonder whether God's listening. But for others, I'm certain that you've been there. There are some in this room that you have been there where you cry out and it seems that your prayers just hit the ceiling and fall back down to the floor useless. Now, God hears your, God hears your prayer. God hears your voice. And God has a perfect timing. God knows exactly how to answer those prayers, and he knows exactly the best way to do it and the right time to do it. So when you're in the, in the will of the Lord, one of the things that gives you great comfort is the knowledge that my God hears my voice. His ear is open unto my cry. He hears the voice of the cry of the righteous. I'm made righteous through Christ, and thus when I pray to him according to his will, I can trust in him that he will hear me. And, and so the Lord is there speaking to this discouraged saint and he's saying, don't, don't be concerned. Be of good cheer. Uh, you, as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, you must also bear witness at Rome. Verse 12, and when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. That's a very kind group of people. Now, there, there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. And so this oath that they bound themselves under is what is called a sacred promise. And because they bound themselves by this oath, they were obligated to fulfill it. In Numbers 30, verse 2, it says, if a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And so they made this binding oath. Paul had not committed a crime worthy of death, but they decided they're going to assassinate him. And there was a, a group of 40 of them that had made a choice to do that. Now, verse 15, now you, therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow as though you're going to make further inquiries concerning him, but we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So when Paul's sister's son, Paul's nephew, heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul, Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, 
Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. The commander took him by the hand, went aside, and asked privately, what is it that you have to tell me? He said, the Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. Do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him, and now they are ready waiting uh, for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. And so this is the only mention of a relative of the Apostle Paul specifically, and it's a nephew. He somehow comes into uh, um, knowledge of this particular plot, and he goes and shares it. You know, secrets are not easily kept amongst so many people. And he got wind of it and brought the news to Paul. Now, one aside, it may be that he has come to faith in Christ through the ministry of Paul, but it isn't specifically stated. But he did come to his aid. And as you see, he, he reveals the plot to the commander. Verse 23, and he called for two centurions. A centurion is a commander over a uh, hundred men, saying, prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen, go to Caesarea at the third hour at 9, 9 p.m. and provide mounts to set Paul on, on and bring him safely to Felix, who's the governor, as well as a cat. Um, I'll wait. I'm sorry. I just have to do that. And so what does he do? He writes a letter, verse 25. Having, he wrote a letter in the following manner. Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor Felix, meow. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm tired. <laughs> Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. Coming with the troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And uh, when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And when it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. And so in a nutshell, as you read that, that's, that's a good synopsis of what took place. We've been reading through and we've seen what took place. But I want you to know one little thing about this. In verse 27, it says, coming with the troops, I rescued him having learned that he was a Roman. And that's not exactly how it took place. Remember how it had actually taken place. Uh, he didn't learn that, uh, that Paul was a Roman until after he had been taken into custody. And that only came after he had, he had ordered that Paul be scourged in order to get information from him. And that's when Paul said, is it lawful for you to, to scourge uh, us, a Roman citizen who has not yet been charged. That's how he found out that he was a Roman. And the only reason I'm bringing this out to you is because we have a tendency of making ourselves look good. And that's what he's doing here. He's covering up what he actually had done. He was going to unlawfully scourge a Roman citizen. That is not included in the letter. He just makes it kind of appear that he was being fair and all because he didn't want to get into any trouble himself. So, verse 31, Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. That would have been, if you're in the city of Jerusalem, you're going north to the west, about 40 miles or so. It's not on the coast, but moving towards the coast there. The next day, they left the horsemen to go, to go on with him and return to the barracks. When they came to Caesarea and had delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from. And when he understood that he was from Cilicia, he said, 
I will hear you when your accusers also have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. And so they put him in a cell. He was taken up to a place called Antipatris. Then he moved him up another 24 miles or so up to the coast, up into Caesarea. And that's where he was, and that's where he's staying. And so uh, he's placed now in a temporary cell, and he's awaiting trial before Felix. He's going to be meeting with him and sharing with him. And we'll be seeing that when we get into chapter 24. But I